tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Three earthquakes off BC's coast and more aftershocks expected. Maybe I can um, have a good, better life in, in, in a different place. More Hong Kong residents consider a move to BC amid mounting political tension. My life has pretty much revolved around the Beatles. Beatle maniac ahead of Paul McCartney's big show, Meet the Vancouver Woman, obsessed with his music. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. Three earthquakes off BC's coast this morning, all within minutes of each other, each measuring between 4.5 and 5.6 in magnitude. The tremors were aftershocks of a stronger quake hitting the same area on Wednesday. None have posed a tsunami threat, but as Tanya Fletcher reports, the quakes have residents of BC's coast double-checking emergency kits. It's freeze-dried food, it's pre-built survival kits, it's water filtration or storage. This, for example, is our... Zenia Platten sells earthquake kits at the Total Prepare store in Victoria. She says sales tend to go up every time there's a significant earthquake. Yeah, we've been seeing a bit more foot traffic and a few more phone-ins with questions and things. Online traffic's ticked up a little bit, yeah. Um, the earthquakes are happening. It stems from the series of morning aftershocks off BC's central coast, enough to jolt some out of bed. Um, the closest community is at, uh, about 200 kilometres from the earthquakes so we wouldn't expect them to feel them strongly but uh, certainly to to give them a little bit of a nudge. The good news bit, no um, tsunami no damage and no injuries. Is this an earthquake? But further down the west coast a more dramatic scene just hours before. Aftershocks are still shaking Southern California following the biggest earthquake there in 20 years. Despite the timing, though, seismologists say there's no connection to the quakes in Canada. These are very active faults all along the western coast of the Americas, um, and they have earthquakes almost daily. So um, the fact that there were two somewhat larger earthquakes within the same week is, is purely coincidence. Still, coincidence is enough to prompt an urgent reminder. We live in a seismic zone. People should have an emergency preparedness plan for their own house. I'm not at all prepared. I have nothing. <laughs> I think we have a, a pantry downstairs that has loaded with food and candles. My wife and I have a plan on where we'll meet up, but that's about the extent of it. The B.C. government says the province itself is constantly reassessing its own preparedness. There's additional monitoring that has been taking place uh, off the west coast through sensors that are, are going to be going on the surface uh, of the ocean. We've also been in, engaged in a significant uh, upgrading over one and a half billion dollars being put into seismically upgrading uh, schools, for example. All critical steps given the repeated warning that it's not a matter of if, but when we'll have to deal with a major earthquake disaster. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. A suspected kidnapper is badly hurt after trying to escape off the balcony of an 11th floor apartment in Burnaby. The man fell all the way down and landed in the bush. Our Andrea Ross is live for us tonight outside the building. Andrea, what more do we know about what happened? Well, Anita, it happened at this building right behind me just after 10 p.m. last night. Police were called here for the suspected kidnapping, and when they arrived, three suspects tried to leave off of the balcony. Uh, we spoke to a witness who described what he saw next. I'm in the 12th floor facing west, and the corner unit just below me, one floor down. I see a guy wearing a black hood. His hood was up. He climbs over the balcony, and, and he's hanging. It looked like he's trying to drop down to the floor below but he slipped and I didn't see, but I heard him fall and fall down to the ground. And that's when my wife pulled me inside and said, you know, don't be out there, it's dangerous. So you can actually see behind me, there's a bush. Uh, it's kind of flattened to that maybe where the man had landed, but he did suffer serious injuries and he remains in hospital. The Independent Investigations Office is investigating and that could take weeks or months. Um, here's what they had to say today. Our uh, role is to determine whether any action or inaction uh, of the police uh, had anything to do with him falling from the balcony. The, the victim of the alleged kidnapping is fine and not injured, but all three suspects remain in custody. Anita? The CBC's Andrea Ross reporting live from Burnaby tonight. Thank you.
Political tension and high living costs. Experts say there are signs of an exodus from Hong Kong. And our John Hernandez is finding out why some residents have decided to relocate right here in Vancouver. Chris Ho lands safely at YVR just days after protesters flooded the streets of Hong Kong. Everyone is really careful in Hong Kong. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're speaking, you, you're really scared. Everyone is like this. It's really horrible. Horrible. Ho has a Canadian passport, but he's lived in Hong Kong for more than two decades. Now, as China tightens its control of the region and the cost of living skyrockets, Ho has decided to move to BC for good. Compared to Hong Kong, Vancouver is heaven. He brought along a friend, hoping he'll stay here too. He recommended me to, to follow him, to walk around the, the, the city and, and feel, the, feel the people and then and see, see what can I do in here. Experts say stories like these are becoming more common thanks to mounting civil unrest. Controversy surrounding the region's extradition bill opened the floodgates. Migration firms in Hong Kong have seen business boom since mid-June. The uh, fugitive uh, you know, bill will actually make people more determined that they have to leave now. With more than 300,000 Hong Kong residents holding Canadian passports, Canada is among the most popular destinations. I think what we're seeing now is a fourth wave of Chinese immigration to Canada. Realtor Dan Scarrow says Vancouver has seen a noticeable uptick in prospective home buyers from Hong Kong just in the past two weeks. It's going to take a while for that data to flow through the system, but it was really noticeable amongst our agents over the last couple weekends. Some say the trend is hard to quantify at this point. Immigration lawyer Will Tao says the picture will become clearer as more students from Hong Kong enroll in BC schools. The big trend will come from international students and once they go into schools, and, and, and I'm sure individuals from the Hong Kong diaspora are going to be excellent students in Canada, uh, I do see that as a pathway. As of the 2016 census, Metro Vancouver is home to about 75,000 immigrants from Hong Kong. It's a number that experts say will grow as Hong Kong's sovereignty from mainland China draws closer to its end. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Too little, too late. A BC man is suing the province for its delay in providing an expensive drug he claims could have saved him from permanent disability. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us now. Dan, what is his main argument here? Anita, 21-year-old Paul Chung claims his charter rights were violated. The lawsuit says Chung was rushed to Langley Memorial Hospital in August 2017 with acute renal failure. He was told he suffered from atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Chung was asked if he had private health insurance because a miracle drug did exist, but not through the public system. Soliris cost $750,000 a year, and back then, BC didn't cover it. It eventually did in November 2017 on a case-by-case -case basis. Chung says he did get some of the drug, but only three months' worth because he claims he didn't improve. His lawsuit says the drug works best early when someone is diagnosed. He's now on permanent dialysis. Chung is suing the government for negligence for what he says was an arbitrary decision to delay his coverage. He also claims his charter rights to life, liberty and security of the person were violated. The province has not yet filed a response and none of these claims have been proven in court. Now, Chung has started an online fundraiser, but it says it could take seven years for him to get a kidney transplant and he will still need Soliris to protect a new kidney from getting affected by the disease. Anita? Thanks, Dan. One person is in hospital after a late night fire at an empty house in Surrey. It happened in the Guildford neighborhood just before midnight. One man suffered second degree burns to his arm and he was taken to hospital. Six others escaped without injury. Firefighters believe they were squatters. I think it was in the transition of being sold and was once a recovery house. So there was no permanent residence that we know of. Officials say electricity to the house had been shut off earlier in the day. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Police on Vancouver Island are warning owners to check recreational vehicles and campers. It comes after Saanich police arrested two men in connection with two separate break-ins. In the first case, an RV owner noticed a naked man using the homeowner's garden hose. Police say it appears that man had been living in the RV for at least a few days. Just 30 minutes after that arrest, police were called somewhere else for a similar report. 
My husband brought the keys out, and when he tried to unlock the door, he physically couldn't turn the lock, which meant the person was on the other side holding the door shut. Police managed to get that squatter out with help of a service dog. Both incidents happened on Wednesday night and resulted in arrests and charges against both men. The owner of a Vancouver mansion is suing the city over his $128,000 empty homes tax bill. Sao Po Wong wants an extension to prove he was living in the home in 2017. Wong's two-story house is currently for sale for $16.9 million. According to a notice of civil claim, he accidentally filed documents from the wrong year in support of his home status. Wong's lawyers say he didn't receive any further correspondence from the city because he was out of the country. The city has yet to respond to his claim. We do have more details on this story online at cbc.ca slash bc. Well, a two-block stretch of 75A Avenue in Surrey could soon be known by a new name, the Comagata Maru. Council will vote on Monday night to install commemorative street signs in honor of the hundreds of Indian migrants who were on the Comagata Maru ship. More than 370 people were forced to wait off Vancouver's coast for two months in 1914 before the ship was turned back. Mayor Doug McCallum says Surrey is an appropriate place for a tribute like this because of its large South Asian population. This had been a disgrace, um, in, in certainly my opinion and Council's opinion. And so we needed to recognize that this shouldn't ever happen again. When the Komagata Maru was sent back to India, British soldiers were waiting and 20 passengers were killed. Many more, including Raj Tour's grandfather, were put in jail when a riot broke out. During that tragedy, those passengers suffered a lot and their sacrifice is going to be recognized by the uh, city of Surrey. So we are all very happy. Uh, so, uh, all the family members are very happy. Council will also vote Monday night on whether to install a storyboard that tells the history of the Co Magata Maru at R.A. Nicholson Park. Well, high staff turnover and difficulty finding new recruits. Employers in Whistler say they've been struggling, but as Mickey Cowan reports, nearly 50 chefs from Morocco have made their way to the resort community in the past few months. It was a dream come true for Moroccan Noel Bin Zakri. I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so happy. <laughs> oh, wow, I will go to Canada, no way. Vince Cree sent her resume to a recruitment company in Whistler just a few months ago. Fast forward to today, and she's working as a chef at the Fairmont Chateau Whistler. It's difficult, but I can make a career here faster than in Morocco. Ben Zakri is just one of around 50 chefs now cooking up careers in the skier's paradise. The Barefoot Bistro says it's a constant struggle to find enough workers, hiring 10 to 12 new people every season. Many restaurants cut hours due to staff shortages, so having steady workers is a sigh of relief. It's been great having them, and also because it's more long-term. So we know that they're with us for a while. Joel Chevalier worked in the industry for years and saw the shortage firsthand. So when he traveled to Morocco on a trip, a light bulb went on. Uh, Morocco has been a real great hotbed for tourism. And so it's filled with, uh, with Western restaurant styles and hotels. Uh, and so people have been trained really well. Since September, Chevalier has been connecting cooks with more than a dozen restaurants in Whistler, all looking for experienced chefs willing to stick around. Then he helps them apply for two-year work visas with Ottawa's Francophone Mobility Program, designed to bring in French-speaking, skilled workers. Uh, there's a lot of young, talented chefs that are really interested in trying a new life in Canada. Workers can stay for two to four years under the visa program, an eternity for the worker-deprived restaurant industry. They're kind of locked in for two years, which gives us a little bit more stability. Although not all of them want to leave when the time comes. You're in this four months, I, I decide to stay here forever. The demand for Moroccan chef recruitments is expanding beyond Whistler too. Next week, Chevalier will head back overseas and hire up to 40 more. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. 
parking a car share vehicle could soon be a lot easier in Vancouver. City Council is considering free parking at meters. Right now, most car share vehicles can only be left in certain residential and designated parking areas. Options include letting them park at city meters for free for up to two hours while rented, or allowing zero emission car shares to end trips at meters for a 50% discount to the company, perhaps even waiving those fees entirely. The city report says around 34% of adults in Vancouver have a car share membership. Well, if you're near the Skeena River in northern BC this month, you might notice some of the water is fluorescent red. Don't panic. It's all part of a planned drill to simulate a toxic oil spill. A non-toxic dye is being released into the river throughout July by the Kitsum Kalem First Nation near Terrace, BC. The goal? To track how and where the spill could flow. The CN Rail Corridor travels uh, right along the Skeena, so a derailment could likely affect that river, which is a crucial biological ecosystem. The salmon ecosystem in the Skeena River is, uh, is an economic engine for the entire watershed and, and as you're indicating, the province uh, at large. So the idea behind the study is that uh, understanding the spill pathways will help local communities understand where it is that needs to be protected during the event uh, of a spill or something like that. The simulation is taking place as sea and rail traffic to the port of Prince Rupert continues to grow. The Fun City Festival in North Vancouver is slipping and sliding away. Organizers say the event is cancelled because its water slide provider has pulled out of its commitment. On its website, Fun City Slider says the cost of delivering the event was too high. Over the past year, the city of North Vancouver, as you can see here, has organized a thousand foot water slide running down Lonsdale. Anyone who already bought tickets will be getting a refund from the provider. And it's been a long time since we last spotted the endangered southern resident killer whale in BC waters, but they are back. Scientists with Fisheries and Oceans Canada are celebrating after seeing members of K-Pod, L-Pod and J-Pod off the west coast of Vancouver Island, including the new calf born in May, J-31. The whales were seen swimming and jumping off the west coast of Vancouver Island. On June 27th, four members of L-Pod were spotted near Carmina Point. Then on June 30th, whales from J and K-Pod were seen near Pachina Lighthouse. It had been an unusually long time since the southern residents were last seen in the Salish Sea. For more on the future of the southern resident killer whales, you'll want to listen to a new CBC BC podcast, Killers, J-Pod on the Brink, is hosted by Gloria Makarenko, and the first episode comes your way July 18th. You can subscribe right now wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brett Soderholm is here now with the first check of the weather. And uh, like you predicted, Brett, much of a cloudy day today. Cloudy, a little bit rainy. And I'm going to be honest, Anita, this is one time where I'm actually glad to not be outside on the balcony. I'm a bit of an indoor cat myself right now. <laughs> so I'm going to look at these temperatures from the comfort of the studio instead. Notice how we're actually quite a lot colder right now across all of the lower mainland. Vancouver Airport only at 17. That would be normal for essentially late April into early May. But even Victoria, worth mentioning that's only about 14 degrees right now so it is definitely chilly I will give you that this is abnormally chilly for July the reason for this is pretty straightforward we've got a lot of cloud that was kind of over the area this was preventing the Sun from shining on through and that green on there indicates some scattered showers that were going through now not a lot of this is going to be expected to be accumulating on the ground but it is worth mentioning that elsewhere in the province I am keeping a keen eye on the potential for some severe thunderstorms to develop so Environment Canada right now has issued a severe thunderstorm watch anywhere along Highway 3 connecting Grand Forks over to Creston and specifically Kootenai Pass. So we know that the weather is very variable into those mountain passes, so do be cautious over there. And I wanted to show you what it's looking like right now. We're seeing quite a few lightning strikes pop up. This is just going to be over Kootenai Lake, east of Nelson. And then same thing right around Grand Forks and also into the interior. Lots of rain on way for them. All right, Brett, thank you very much. You're welcome. CBC's free concert series, Musical Nooners, kicked off its 10-year anniversary today.
fans were treated to the musical stylings of not just one great artist, but three. The Harpoonists and the Axe Murderer were joined on stage by gospel soul artist Don Pemberton. There was also free ginger beer, and it was very good, and a create-your-own CBC tie-dye shirt section to celebrate 10 years of highlighting local artists. Our free outdoor concert series runs weekdays from 12 to 1 p.m. throughout the summer. And as always, this newscast and all of our stories are available online for you to watch anytime. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram to stream our content live and on demand. You can also watch us on our free mobile app, CBC Gem, and go more in depth on our stories by visiting cbc.ca slash bc. An Ontario cabinet minister is in hot water after a confrontation backstage at a Rolling Stones concert. That and much more coming up. Raptors, Raptors, Raptors. Danny Green, who recently won the NBA championship with the Toronto Raptors, is in Vancouver to host a basketball camp right now. Before he does, he took some time to sign autographs for fans, and there were a lot of them. Take a look. Came down here uh, first thing in the morning, you know, around 3.30, and then luckily I was the first one in line, so uh, I wouldn't miss it for anything anyways, right? Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce two-time NBA champion, Danny Green. We were at Oak Lake. We watched game three. We saw you guys. Thank you so much. Big man, how you doing? Have you ever seen this kind of pandemonium amongst fans, whether it's been in the U.S. or in Canada before? Have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, I've seen at a certain extent in San Antonio, but it's obviously it's a bigger, different when it's, it's a different animal when it's in a whole country and it's 36 million. But uh, it's been amazing. Um, so we had a, cra a great draw throughout the whole country and other cities, and um, you know we're enjoying it. I just thank him, you know, for, for all of his hard work off the court, like with his program, basketball program with the kids and whatnot, right? So I like said, he said thank you, you know, he appreciate that and just, you know, shook my hand. <laughs> the fans here have been welcoming, not just to me, but to everybody, to all of us, and made it feel at home regardless of how long we've been here, everybody feels like they're at home. Dan, you saw a couple Vancouver Grizzlies jerseys today. Do you think Vancouver should get an NBA team back? I do believe so. Vancouver is a, a wonderful city. It's really nice, a great fan base, and um, probably better than some other cities that we have in the States, but um, who knows? Hello, man. What's up, big dog? You doing all right? I got a marker. You all right? I got you, bro. Love that handshake, Danny Green's big hand and the little boy's small hand, it's very cute. Green was also asked about Kawhi Leonard and the frenzy around his free agency. He had three words, get your popcorn. Hope you got the rest uh, of your news from our online show and, and right now in our show. We'll be back in just a few moments with what's making headlines across the country. The Alberta government is spending $2.5 million to track down what it calls foreign funding meddling into the province's energy sector. But as the CBC's Rafi Buchikanian reports, critics say the public inquiry really won't amount to much. Stampede season in Calgary for Albertans, the greatest show on earth. 
but the theater of politics is never far away. Instead of trying to channel people's anger about the fact that they need jobs uh, towards a pretend enemy, what they should do is just focus on creating those jobs. The government says the oil sector, producer of many of those jobs, has real enemies. The public inquiry will look at the foreign influences it thinks fund those opponents. It will investigate all of the national and international connections, follow the money trail, and expose all of the interests involved. Kenny says cash from abroad targets pipeline projects and pro-oil politicians. We want to understand what exactly lies behind this campaign to defame and landlock Canadian energy. A commissioner appointed by the government will have a year to do some digging, including to potentially compel witness testimony. But if that happens, there could be pushback, warns this legal group that protects environmentalists. If we determined that this show trial would somehow harm the environmental movement? Sure, we'd represent them. Meanwhile, at least one group named by the government says it's got nothing to hide. We're happy to uh, participate in and participate in a, in a public inquiry and uh, our uh, track record of working with industry to advance environmental improvements in the oil sands I think speaks for itself. The province expects a report out of the public inquiry by July of next year. It's also funding a $30 million energy war room, it says, to fight misinformation about the energy industry. Rafi Bujikan, UN CBC News, Edmonton. An Ontario cabinet minister says she's apologized after a confrontation with the owner of the Ottawa Senators. Lisa McLeod says the Ontario, she is the Ontario Minister of Tourism and admits she was blunt to Eugene Melnick. But as the CBC's Mike Crawley reports, Melnick claims she went much further than that. It happened at last weekend's Rolling Stones concert in a field north of Barrie, Ontario. Before the Stones took the stage, the crowd got an official welcome from Ontario's Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, Lisa McLeod. On the sidelines of the show, McLeod confronted Eugene Melnick, owner of the NHL's Ottawa Senators. According to two Ottawa newspapers, Melnick says the cabinet minister hurled abuse at him, used the F word twice, called him a loser and a piece of SHIT. McLeod is not denying it happened. This morning on Twitter, the cabinet minister said she gave Melnick some feedback and says she apologized for being so blunt. Ontario's official opposition is questioning whether McLeod should remain in cabinet. That is um, certainly a decision that uh, Mr. Ford's going to have to make about what he considers to be uh, the quality uh, that he expects and the behavior of his ministers. So far, I would say that it's been pretty appalling. Neither McLeod nor Melnick could be reached for comment today. In a statement, the Ottawa senators say Melnick stands by his version of what happened. Melnick spoke with Premier Doug Ford and says he was impressed with how Ford handled the situation. McLeod has been one of Ford's most controversial ministers through his first year in power. She faced criticism for her handling of the autism program as Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Ford demoted her to Tourism, Culture and Sport Minister last month. Today, the Premier's office declined to comment. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the RCMP is getting a new look, or at least some of its members will be. The Mounties are implementing some new policies that break from tradition and give uniformed personnel the option of more casual clothes. CBC's Travis Kingdon explains the dress code changes. For the first time ever, frontline RCMP officers are allowed to grow a beard. It's one of the changes made in May to their uniform and dress policy. Officers can choose to wear an RCMP-issued ball cap, too, instead of the traditional police hat. So far, the changes have had good reviews. I've been an RCMP officer over 38 years, and we've always, you know, we're very traditional. Any, any changes, I guess I'll, I'll say someone who's been around as long as I have, are a little hard to accept. But I certainly recognize that we do have to change with the times. And, uh, you know, I think both changes, both the facial hair and, and the ability of our frontline officers to wear a ball cap are positive changes. Officers with long hair are allowed to wear it below their collar now, in a ponytail or a braid. Sergeant Leanne Butler says members have been asking for these changes for a while. It may help with recruitment, it helps with morale when a member is comfortable and um, 
they know that their needs have been listened to, then of course they uh, will be able to uh, pay attention to their job and uh, do it very well. Officers who do choose to grow a beard will have to carry a razor just in case of emergency because some safety equipment won't seal properly with facial hair. Sergeant Kevin Bailey says he hopes the policy encourages new recruits to the RCMP as some people might have been discouraged by the policies in the past. Travis Kingdon, CBC News, Charlottetown. How does the Lower Mainland maintain its local food sources? Soaring land prices are pushing farmers out what some are doing to stay in the game after the break. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Three earthquakes registering between 4.5 and 5.6 in magnitude hit BC's coast early this morning. The tremors are classified as aftershocks to yesterday's quake south of Haida Gwaii. 
A suspected kidnapper is badly hurt after falling 11 floors from a Burnaby apartment. He was trying to flee the scene of an alleged crime by escaping off the balcony. He fell into the bushes below. But now the Independent Investigations Office is looking into police interaction with the man. I think this is the end game. We never did this before. We have we never did, done this before. Mounting political tension in Hong Kong is causing more people living there to consider making a new home in BC. One Vancouver immigration consultant says migration orders at his agency have doubled from about 30 to 60 a month. Well, soaring land prices in the Lower Mainland are pushing some farmers out. But as Andrea Ross reports, a new generation is trying to keep food local while facing an uncertain future. I think we're in a position of most young farmers in BC is that we are farmers without farmland and our prospects for gaining farmland are pretty much zero. Doug Zacklin and his partner Gemma McNeil are living their dream. They grow vegetables in Surrey on an acre and a half of land that's been in his family for almost a hundred years. But they worry every harvest could be their last. And there's always a real estate agent knocking on the door and there's always a question of taxes and, and all sorts of issues that make it unsure. So it's really hard to farm here because you never know how long we'll be able to be here. The couple are featured in a new documentary called Tomorrow's Harvest about the challenges facing young BC farmers. They say the biggest issue is access to land. In the Metro Vancouver area, an acre of land can cost up to a million dollars. This is forcing some to think outside the box. We might need to get together with some other farmers. We might need to look at building a community or a co-op or something. Advocates say the industry needs support now if we want to have local food in the future. I think sometimes uh, we don't realize what we have until we're about to lose it. We can make decisions um, as communities, as a society where we're choosing to support and empower local food production um, that's going to be good for the farmers and good for uh, all of us who are eating the food that they produce as well. Farmers say right now is a pivotal time. We are at a kind of turning point where we could make some really important policy decisions that would make it viable for future generations to farm, and that's um, pretty crucial for us as a society as a whole to have a more sustainable and enjoyable lifestyle. McNeil wants people to feel connected to local food so they know why it's worth protecting. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. And the documentary Tomorrow's Harvest is available online on CBC Gem. And if you are tuning in tomorrow, it airs on CBC TV at 9 p.m. local time. You are looking at a live shot of downtown Vancouver, a cruise ship in the background there. Scattered showers throughout the day, a mixed bag for the weekend. Brett is here with the full forecast next.
Well, it's that time of year again. The Calgary Stampede is out of the chute for the 107th time. Despite some rainy weather, the annual Stampede Parade kicked off the start of the 10-day event, which bills itself as the greatest outdoor show on Earth. The parade featured more than 100 entries, including 32 floats and 19 bands from across Canada and around the globe. This year's parade marshal is Amber Marshall from CBC's Heartland. <laughs> Looks like they have the same weather as us. They do. And yeah. I have to say, though, that is a very fitting name for that role. It's I think great. that was like her destiny at yeah. this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. No, all of Western Canada right now, we are in this together. If you're in BC, if you're in Alberta, we're the ones that are getting the kind of cloudy, rainy weather. And meanwhile, the East is sweating like crazy. It's so hot over there. Uh, but no, we are not going to be sweating too much right now. Instead, I wanted to show you a live shot of outside BC Place right now. This is looking south down Canby Street Bridge. And uh, lots of cloud. I mean, this really didn't budge much throughout the day. We had a few scattered showers. Fortunately, none of those actually impacted our musical nooners, which took place today. But unfortunately, I'd have to say, showers are going to be in our forecast for the next little part of the weekend. I'm going to be honest with you here. This is probably one of the toughest forecasts I've had to make since I've been here because this weekend is just not cooperating. There's actually the chance for a little bit of everything, and I'll explain that. So in the overnight period tonight, we are expecting mainly cloudy conditions. There's a slight risk for showers. Overnight lows, 14. No problem. Saturday, this is the really tricky day. I would honestly bet that there is going to be cloud, there are going to be showers, and we may even get a few breaks of sunshine toward the end of the day. Daytime highs are going to be comfortable right around that 20 degree mark, but we are really going to get a mixture of everything. And if that sun doesn't happen, I'm sorry, the clouds can sometimes win over here. It's kind of how I'm feeling for Sunday. It is likely to be a mostly cloudy day there as well. Scattered showers largely throughout the morning, and again, a daytime high of around 20 degrees. Now, as I I said all of Western Canada is in this together. We have a big area of low pressure right now centered over BC and this is bringing widespread rain throughout the weekend not only to us on the south coast but basically the southern half of BC as a whole and throughout the overnight period as I mentioned we could be dealing with a few scattered showers but mostly I would be watching for Saturday afternoon and that's going to show up right about here. You're going to see that just to the west of Vancouver we have a few showers there but by the evening I expect a little bit of clearing to be happening. Now as has kind of become my thing I do love to mention how the fire, fire danger rating here is going to be quite low especially through the interior so that is good news but in terms of when that sunshine is going to be coming out it's probably not going to be until essentially Monday that's the day to be watching potentially 21 degrees as our daytime high so I wish I could say here comes the sun for the upcoming weekend I know on Saturday we've got a few Beatles fans Paul McCartney is of course going to be playing in Vancouver but if only I could promise that I don't know I'll keep my fingers crossed I will also so keep my fingers crossed. I am hoping for more sunshine. Yeah, you and me both. At this point, I could definitely use it too. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Brett. Mm -hmm. Well, a new study says the most effective way to fight global warming is a simple one. Plant more trees. Yeah, Swiss scientists say the additional vegetation would, in the long run, help suck up a significant amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. As Thomas Degla explains, it's going to take a trillion trees to make a difference. Well, this study comes from Switzerland and it's published today in the journal Science. It says there is room for nearly a billion hectares of extra trees around the world. That's roughly the entire size of Canada. And the study comes with a map showing the world where there is tree coverage now and where there could be more trees. Scientists have known for a long time the trees absorb and store carbon dioxide, a gas that contributes to the planet's gradual warming. But this study is thought to be the first major calculation of how many trees could be planted worldwide, taking into consideration the makeup of cities and cropland. Researchers call it forest restoration, and they say Canada alone has enough room for an extra 78 million hectares. That's bigger than the size of Alberta. As soon as those trees are in the ground, they start sucking up carbon every single year. And that extra carbon is going to decrease the atmospheric emissions that we do every single year. Now, the study says planting this many trees could reduce CO2 by more than 200 gigatons. In other words, that would mean 25% less carbon in the atmosphere. It is a staggering project requiring a century, perhaps, to reach its full effect, not to mention an estimated $300 billion. Still, that is less 
than other projects meant to reduce greenhouse gases on this scale. If we were to stop trying simply because it might not be possible to do everything, that would be devastating. That's exactly the kind of issue and mindset that has got us into this trouble in the first place. And the study's authors themselves warned that climate change itself is cutting short the time left to plant this many trees. And critics say uh, this research simply isn't backed up by previous studies and that a tree planting program of this magnitude just wouldn't be feasible. Thomas Stagg to CBC News, London. Venezuela marks Independence Day, but for many, there's little to celebrate. That's coming up. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year, so grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. And join us at the Surrey Fusion Festival on July 20th to 21st at Holland Park. Swing by our tent for fun and prizes and meet CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Michelle Elliott. For more on these events, check us out online. Venezuelans are marking Independence Day, but for many in that country, there's little to celebrate. A scathing UN report says the government is targeting President Nicolas Maduro's political opponents using torture and murder to silence them. As Arthi Pohl tells us, the allegations number in the thousands. A grand military parade and a speech from President Nicolas Maduro to rally support in the midst of a deepening political and economic crisis. <laughs> Elsewhere, protests led by opposition leader Juan Guaido. <laughs> fueled by long-standing grievances against Maduro and by a new UN report detailing police and military brutality against political opponents. Today, the UN human rights chief delivered a blistering critique on Maduro's regime. Nearly 7,000 Venezuelans have been killed during security operations in the past 18 months. Many constituted executions. My office has also documented excessive use of force in the context of security operations by the Special Action Forces, 
with multiple killings mainly of young men. Many could constitute extrajudicial killings and should be fully investigated. She says security forces routinely sent death squads to murder young men. Thousands more detained for political reasons have been tortured and sexually abused. It makes it absolutely clear that there is a full-blown human rights crisis that has been unfolding in Venezuela. Amnesty International Canada says the UN report is a start, but further steps need to be taken. We, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, many other organizations in Venezuela have called for is that states need to convene at the UN a commission of inquiry that will have real powers to carry out probing investigations to truly get at the heart of this human rights crisis and importantly, identify who needs to be held accountable. Venezuela's deputy foreign minister calls the report biased and distorted. Meanwhile, today in the US, the secretary of state reaffirmed support for the opposition leader and for Venezuelans yearning for a return to democracy. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. Military leaders in Sudan have reached an agreement to share power with an opposition alliance. It's all in an effort to calm tensions in the African country a week after a major protest. As the CBC's Derek Stoffel reports, demonstrators have been calling on the country's generals to hand over power for months. Right across Sudan, people celebrated news of the power-sharing agreement hoping it will bring peace and stability back to their country. Thank God for this victory, this woman says. Sudan has been rocked by protests since late last year. The demonstrations brought down longtime President Omar al-Bashir in April, but soon after, the country's military seized power, sending protesters back onto the streets again. Then, a month ago, the army cracked down, killing more than a hundred people. On Sunday, there were huge demonstrations across Sudan, but soldiers once again opened fire and at least seven people died. Now, just days later, word of this power-sharing agreement, it will see control of the country rotate between the military and opposition activists over the next three years before national elections. For months now, many of the demonstrators have blamed this man, General Mohammed Hamdan, and his military unit, accusing them of using brutal tactics. But today, the general welcomed the power-sharing agreement, saying it will not exclude anyone. Opposition activists also welcomed the deal, though cautiously. Some Sudanese are critical, saying the agreement falls short of a government totally led by the people. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, London. This gets me in tomorrow to, uh, to, to see Paul. Uh, it's the most important thing in the world to me right now. That's three and a half hours of heaven. Ahead of Paul McCartney's big BC Place concert tomorrow, we meet a local Beatlemaniac.
December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Meng, what do you have to say to the charges? Download Sanction today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, Paul McCartney is playing a show here in Vancouver tomorrow night, and you can bet music lovers will be lining up for the chance to see the former Beatle in person. And I'm willing to bet that few of them will be as excited <laughs> as one woman who's been collecting Beatles memorabilia for four decades. Deborah Goebel caught up with her to find out what it is about the Fab Four she loves so much. My name is Ginger, and I'm a Beatle maniac. How to explain Ginger said Larova's love of Paul McCartney and all things Beatle? I was nine years old and somehow the Beatles found me and my life changed. That she was still just a toddler when they broke up mattered not one bit. It was probably in, in about 14, 15 that Paul wasn't going to marry me. That's okay. I, I just want him to be happy and I found someone myself and she's never stopped being a fan. It's, I've had this since I was a teenager. It's, it's, it's one of those very few, you know, I love Paul pins. And when I was planning for my wedding, um, I, you know, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. So I wore this under my dress as my something blue. For 40 years, she's been collecting Beatles memorabilia. Her husband insists she keep it all in one room. I've got my buddies who understand they're the same as me. I'm not alone. Connection with her Beatle buddies, as she calls them, is a big part of it. You'd be surprised, she says, how many of them there are out there. Oh, 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 yeah. But it's the music that kept her devoted all these years. Makes me so freaking happy. So to say that she is excited about seeing Paul McCartney in concert again is kind of an understatement. Mwah. This is my ticket. Um, this, this gets me in tomorrow to, uh, to, to see Paul. Ginger gets that some people might think she's a little obsessed, but she doesn't really care because being a longtime Beatles fan makes her happy. Uh, it's the most important thing in the world to me right now. That's three and a half hours of heaven. Their music makes her happy. Their words make her happy. And the first one said to the second one there, I hope you're having fun and I'm going to cry. It's about connection and belonging and maybe even a little nostalgia. Why does it make you almost cry? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just getting really excited. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm 14 years old again right now, and I, I won't turn 50 again till Sunday. <laughs> Deborah Goble, CBC News, Burnaby. I love that. Yeah, and, that enthusiasm. It's and real. people have been making fun of me because I'm going for the fourth time to see Paul McCartney tomorrow, but <laughs> I bet she's seen him oh. way more than four times. Uh, yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Have fun out there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now to Indonesia's Bali Island, where wildlife conservationists are starting to turn the tide on illegal poaching of sea turtles. Yes, today a small step in that direction also offered new beginnings for some hatchlings. <laughs> Local children and tourists were on hand to help release about 80 baby sea turtles into the wild. All of Ridley's sea turtles are considered to be a vulnerable species. Oh my gosh, they're so cute. Turtles are still consumed in Indonesia during religious ceremonies, and they are also killed for leather. But recent awareness campaigns have helped bring down poaching and consumption. Because who would want to hurt those little I know. guys? I honestly didn't know that they were still used in ceremonies. That was, that was a fact that I just learned right now. There you go. You learn something every day exactly. on CBC Vancouver News. They are adorable, though, that's for sure. Yes, that is it for tonight. You can find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan is here at 11 after the national. Good night. <laughs>